everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this webinar on the Citizens Institute on Rural Design. This will be an overview of the program and the opportunity for local communities to host a design workshop in 2018. This webinar is being pre-recorded in lieu of the live webinar that was scheduled for January 25th. We would like to apologize for the, the technical challenges we um, encountered during that live webinar, but we're really excited to be able to walk through this opportunity with you and so that you can listen to this recording at your own pace. The Citizens Institute on Rural Design is a National Endowment for the Arts Leadership Initiative in partnership with Project for Public Spaces along with the Orton Family Foundation. This webinar is specifically intended to provide information about the program and help communities develop an application to receive assistance in hosting a local design workshop in the 2018 year. Today, we will feature two presenters. The voice you're hearing right now is Jen Hughes, Acting Director of Design and Creative Placemaking at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm joined on the line by Cynthia McKeaton, Director of the Citizens Institute on Rural Design and Senior Vice President at Project for Public Spaces. We also are very fortunate to have Angela Moreno Long, who is your CIRD point of contact. As you email her and ask questions about the program, she'll be very responsive um, and is really looking forward to helping collaborate during this stage in the application process. We are hosting this webinar today to help you decide whether or not this program, which is a combination of technical assistance and a two-day intensive public workshop, is a right fit for your community. We certainly welcome questions to be emailed at CIRD at PPS.org. We're very thankful for the many participants who have registered to listen in on this event. Um, so you will soon receive a link to the recording following today's event. So let's get on with the webinar. So first, I just wanted to share a little bit about the National Endowment for the Arts. For those of you who aren't familiar, the NEA is dedicated to strengthening the creative capacity of our communities by providing all Americans with diverse opportunities for arts and design participation. The NEA is the only federal government agency specifically dedicated to supporting arts and culture. We offer grant-making programs, including place-based funding streams, we broker local and national, rela national relationships among arts leaders, culture workers, non-arts community leaders, and local, state, and town governments. And lastly, we conduct um, a great deal of research to help advance policy that extends the impact and reach of arts and culture in our nation. The ARD is a very special program of the National Endowment for the Arts, a leadership program that has been focused on building the capacity of communities to integrate design, arts, and culture into their built environments. Let's begin with a very brief overview of the CIRD program. Established in 1991, CIRD provides communities access to the resources and technical assistance they need to convert their own good ideas into reality. In addition to an online resource library, and webinars hosted throughout the year on rural design issues, CIRD works with small towns and rural communities to host community design workshops. With support from a wide range of design, planning, and creative placemaking professionals, CIRD workshops bring together local leaders from nonprofits, community organizations, and the government to develop actionable solutions to the community's most pressing design challenges. And really, these workshops are intended to put the wheels in motion to create a vision that can ultimately be implemented by the local community. Since the program was founded in 1991, CIRD has hosted workshops in all regions of the country, empowering residents to leverage local assets in order to build better places to live, work, and play. So this map helps to give you a sense for the communities where we have 
worked in the past through the CIRD program. We've hosted more than 80 workshops, and if you visit our website, you can browse the comprehensive summaries of our more recent workshops to get a really full sense for the impact of the program. Our website is a wonderful resource to see and learn about workshops that we've hosted in the past. So what do we mean by design? Simply stated, rural design utilizes design strategies, improvements to a community street, buildings, public spaces, or landscapes to address the specific physical, environmental, social and economic challenges facing rural communities. CIRD was founded by the NEA to help connect local leaders and residents of smaller communities and rural areas to the resources, evidence-based knowledge, and design expertise they might need to make the best choices for their community going forward. Participants in the CIRD program produce a two-day local public workshop around a particular design challenge that the community is anxious to address. And we'll get into those specific topic areas on the next slide. This year, for 2018, the request for applications is specifically focused on communities that are anxious to tackle one of these three thematic areas. One, multimodal transportation. Some examples of design challenges might include improving bike and pedestrian access in your community, retrofitting commercial strips to accommodate pedestrians, the development of recreational trails for mobility and economic development, mobility for the elderly and aging in place, context-sensitive rural highways and byways, or the integration of arts, culture, and design to improve transportation or pedestrian experience. Multimodal transportation is one of the key themes that we have seen time and time again as an area that rural communities would love to access design expertise and thinking about. Number two, another workshop theme that communities can apply to is healthy living by design. Examples of design challenges might include creating public space that supports play and active recreation, improving access to healthy food and local ecosystems, enhancing access for walking, biking, and active transportation and recreation, building social cohesion and opportunities for social interaction via creative placemaking. And one of our past workshops that was hosted in Alton, Missouri was a great example of this um, thematic category. There, their artisan and food cooperative was making plans for ways that they could really expand and design a facility that would serve to anchor the downtown while also helping to support jobs in the community around um, artisan and food that could be resold. And third, Main Street. This category, some examples might include leveraging Main Street for economic development, redesigning the physical main street as a local street versus state highway or throughway, cultivating public space on main street via improved design or creative placemaking activities, branding and physical design along the streetscape, historic preservation and adaptive reuse of main street buildings, and maximizing the role that arts and culture can play as an economic driver for local and regional economies. So we ask as communities are thinking about the design challenges that they are facing to really apply for assistance in one of these three categories. So you might be asking, what are the benefits if I'm actually selected to be a CIRD community? Well, first I'll say that CIRD and hosting this local public workshop can be really catalytic. Whether you're looking to make some minor improvements to the downtown or redesigning public space or rethinking other elements of the built environment, it's really great to access ideas and inspiration from rural design experts that are working across the country. So first, um, you will receive a $10,000 cash stipend for planning and hosting that local public, um, public workshop. 
The CIRD program provides honoraria, travel and lodging expenses for up to four regional or national resource team members. And those re resource team members will be selected as those that have the most relevant expertise for the particular issue or challenge that you are trying to tackle in your community. And we'll bring some great best practices and inspiration to help facilitate that conversation. CIRD communities will receive guidance on the development and production of workshop content. There will also be one-on-one -on -one assistance and site visits by the CIRD staff to support the planning for the workshop. CIRD will host conference calls and webinars on relevant rural design topics that will be rolled out throughout this 2018 year. You'll also be able to walk away and help collaborate on an action plan and key summary of what takes place and transpires in the workshop so you can move forward in next steps of implementation. And lastly, CRD is a wonderful program in helping to connect national network of rural practitioners and resources. So you'll not only be able to learn ideas and inspiration from other communities, but you'll be part of a network um, so that you can begin to think and exchange ideas with your peers all over the country. So equally important is to really get a sense for what the expectations are of the selected communities. So you as a community that will be hosting a CIRD workshop are expected to provide a dedicated workshop coordinator. So that's really someone that can help to facilitate all the local logistics will do the extensive outreach for the workshop um, and make sure that they are galvanizing the local community, local partners, as well as local municipal leadership to participate. So you will also work with local partners on the workshop planning. Some of our CIRD participants in the past have set up steering committees to guide that work. I already mentioned that the expectation will be to provide space as well as food or other materials to host a, the logistics for the workshop event. Expectation is also that the local community will be responsible for designing and executing an outreach and communications plan. You know your residents and local community best and how to best reach them. So the expectation is that the selected community will deliver members of the public to participate in this workshop. And you will also help in the reviewing and drafting of the post-workshop action plan. This is really intended to be responsive to what the community articulates as their vision for the future and next steps. So the local communities will be very critical in helping to actually draft that action plan and reflect on what takes place during the local workshop. And lastly, the communities that are selected must provide a once-one -one match, which can be in-kind, meaning donated time, space, materials, or volunteers. And most importantly, you will have to track both cash and in-kind expenditures and provide a final budget report to Project for Public Spaces through the CIRD program. So we hope that we've really enticed you by sort of setting up a little bit about what the potential thematic ideas are for your local workshop, as well as the expectations and benefits to those selected communities. So at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Cynthia to walk us through the details of the opportunity and how you can really get started on applying. Great. Great. Thank you, Jen. Um, that was a wonderful overview of the program. Uh, I'm Cynthia Keaton, and I have been, it's been my honor to direct the CIRD program. Um, this is our fourth series of workshops, and I'm really excited to have a whole new slew of applicants and participants um, listening to this webinar and considering applying. So who is actually eligible? Um, this is a very uh, not a, not a difficult question to ask, but it's quite nuanced. Um, and this is a question that we get many, many times every time we, we run the program. So in our Frequently Asked Questions page on the website, some more detailed information about um, eligibility. But I'm going to give you an overview and some guidelines to help you determine whether or not you're eligible to apply for this award. 
Um, very basically, rural communities in all 50 states are eligible. Um, we welcome communities with a population of less than 50,000 to apply. Suburban communities, which are typically located within or adjacent to a metropolitan area and where the primary land use is residential, are not eligible. Um, and this is something that we can, we can work with you more to determine. Most people, if they're rural, they know it. It's something that you feel intuitively about your community. Um, but there is some gray area there. So very basically, um, this is kind of how we're, we're laying out that, that. That's the basic uh, distinction. Partnerships amongst entities within your community are encouraged. But we do ask one organization to take the lead and submit the application, and that organization will serve as the main point of contact throughout the planning and execution of the workshop. Lead applicants can include local governments, tribal governments, nonprofit entities, regional planning organizations, arts and cultural centers, university community design centers located within 50 miles of the community, main street organizations, Chambers of Commerce, um, it's really quite an extensive list. But if you would like more information, please refer to the RFP for the full list of eligible lead organizations. Please note, state-level agencies can partner on an application but cannot serve um, as the lead applicant. If you're interested in working regionally, um, the specific community or communities that are the focus of the workshop must have a population of 50,000 or less. For example, uh, in Lincoln, Nebraska, we work with the Lincoln-Lancaster County Planning Department. They were the lead organization for 12 rural villages that were hosts of the workshop. None of those villages had a population over 50,000. Cumulatively, yes, they did. But the point is that each of those towns had a population of less than 50,000. So that's, again, something that we can help you sort of think through. But if you do want to work through a county organization or with other multiple um, towns and villages, that's fine. No one can have a population greater than 50,000. Okay. I hope that is clear. All right. This is our application processing timeline. Mark your calendars now for the application deadline, which is Friday, the 16th of February at 5 p.m., so there's about three weeks left uh, before the applications are due. Um, I believe we say this on the application itself, but please do not wait until 4.59 p.m. on Eastern on Friday on the 16th to upload your applications, because if we have a run on a lot of them, the system can get very slow. So please try to get your applications in before uh, the 5 o'clock deadline. Also, no one will be available after 5 p.m. to answer your calls or questions if you're having difficulty with the upload process. So the next thing that happens is that all the applications, all the eligible applications, will be reviewed by a panel of experts selected for their subject matter expertise relative to the design challenges cited in the RFP. So we're going to find people from around the country that are very um, expert professionals in the three workshop topic areas. The panelists and CERT staff will identify six to eight finalists to be interviewed by telephone um, in March. And we will set these, we will notify you beforehand and we will schedule them for a convenient time. The interviews will last about one hour and they will be specifically about questions the panelists have about particular elements of your application. So it's going to be clarifying, qualifying, um, and it's really going to get a sense of what's really going on in the community. Um, people, you know, it's one thing to read something. It's another thing to really talk to the people that are involved. We really, really want to get a sense of, of what your goals are. On that call, someone from each organization listed in your application needs to be represented. If you have five partners, we need somebody from each of those organizations knowledgeable about the application to be on that call. Um, after that, in April, uh, the third staff will provide their recommendations to the NEA 
and the NEA will be making the final decision. Um, as many as four communities will be chosen to host a third workshop this round. Once final host communities are selected um, and notified, third staff will send you a contract to sign. We will give you your stipend at that time. We will do a press release. We will provide you with a press release template so you can do your own press release. There will be announcements um, on the NEA website and their newsletter, the third newsletter, the PPS website. So we will provide a lot of, a lot of press and a lot of media um, and a lot of you know, positive, positive visualization and news about, about your award. In May and June, CERT staff will schedule a two-day on-site visit to visit with each of the four host coordinators and their complete project teams to begin the workshop planning process. Uh, we didn't do that the first round. And we learned how important it is to actually meet you, get to know you, see your community, meet your partners, um, have face-to-face -face time to really talk about what it is you want to achieve. And we actually can get a lot of work done, get you really set up and organized and ready to prepare uh, for your workshop during that. It's a two-day or a day and a half working meetings. Um, we're going to need to meet with everybody, um, all of your partners and folks that have a role in the project. But not everyone needs to be with us for the entire day and a half. Uh, we'd like to do a site visit. Uh, we like to do a tour around. Um, we like to have meals together. It's, it's, a, it's a really a wonderful way of getting to know one another um, and doing, starting to do some really good, exciting work together. And then the workshops will be held um, in the fall of 2018. Um, we could start them earlier if you're ready. We could do July, August. We also know that people are on vacation, people are out of town. We really do want a robust showing at the workshop. So we tend not to do it um, during the summer months. But again, that's something that we will work through with you based on your community, um, your needs, timing, et cetera. OK, I'm next. So getting started. The RFP outlines the criteria by which your application will be judged. Uh, preparing this application is very much a team building and capacity building exercise. So even if your application is not successful, it's worthwhile applying because you will be that much further along in defining your challenge and closer to identifying your goals and pulling a team together, getting support from your local municipality. And that will help you to seek out other funding opportunities or to apply for CERD in the future. And it gives you a, really a very strong, cohesive, coherent document um, that you can use going forward. So it's, it's, really worth, it's really worthwhile if you are eligible to go ahead and do it. Um, and we've heard that from, from a lot of people that were not selected. But going through this application process really created a very strong cohort of local leaders and advocates for their community. Uh, so if you haven't already, um, review the RFP and eligibility requirements and solidify your application partners and gather um, letters of support. And this is really where you can start talking up the vision your community's vision, what your goals are, what you want to achieve, what your challenges are. So even as you're putting the application together, you can still be doing sort of a marketing, community building, awareness building campaign amongst people to get folks excited that you are actually going forward with this award. Um, do read the frequently asked questions on the website. Um, and the coordinator's manual has a lot of helpful information. We developed the coordinator's manual really as a step-by-step, -step, soup to nuts guide to how to put a workshop together. What makes a successful workshop? We provide templates for invitations. We provide templates for workshop agendas. Uh, we provide templates for press release announcements. There's a lot in the coordinator's manual that will really help you. And other folks have also told us that just having that coordinator's manual, which tells you everything about how to put together a community-wide event like this, is really helpful to them for planning other kinds of conferences, forums, 
meetings and convenings. So we do try to provide a number of resources to rural communities above and beyond the $10,000 award and our stellar technical assistance. We really try to provide resources that will help you in the long run, whether or not you're part of this program, because we are committed to helping rural communities meet their design challenges, whatever they are. Um, okay. All right, I'm going to move on to crafting an outstanding application. And this is really about what you need to include and what we're going to be looking for in your application. The workshop concept is, is key. Um, your workshop concept needs to state a clearly defined need for design assistance at this time. Uh, demonstrate that the assistance is relevant to meeting your community's goals and timely in that you have identified a problem and challenges are clearly, uh, but maybe don't know what the solutions are, haven't identified exactly what you want to do, but you're agreed on an issue. You're agreed that you really want to turn that vacant high school into a community multi-arts and culture center. You have no idea how to do it. Um, you have already gone through the process of realizing it's not going to be senior housing. It's not going to be turned into luxury condos. You really want it to be a multi, um, sort of multi-community art center. So you need to have taken that step, but be at a point to say, wow, we, we really need help getting to the next level with this. Um, your concept should also demonstrate a desire to encourage uh, the community and participation in the workshop by people of diverse ethnicity, cultural backgrounds, age, gender, and income that are reflective of your demographics. If your community is, for example, 54% African American, we would be looking for a large percentage of participation from the African American community, or the Hispanic community, or an Asian community, or an elderly community. Um, and that's a challenge, that's something that we can help you with, but we really are looking um, for that. And I don't know that we've said this before, but the workshop itself, we're looking for about 35 to 40 participants who will commit to be there with us for the entire two days. Um, your, your proposal also should consider preliminary plans for conducting follow-up activities, taking action based on workshop results, and a commitment to sharing the results more broadly with the community and even neighboring towns. Um, if you have plans or ideas or other projects underway that this workshop will support, things you're already doing, things that you did a year ago that this can build on, and this workshop will move it forward, include that information in your application and explain how a third workshop will help build on the prior work you've done. We don't want to look at funding duplicative efforts, but we do if you already got something underway we want to see how we can take it further. So you see in this slide from Thomasville, Georgia. Uh, their project was about how to restore and revitalize McIntyre Park, which also had a lot of flooding problems and was at the confluence of three rivers um, in Thomasville. So there was hydrology issues and stormwater issues and riparian health issues. It was also across the street from a high school that was about to do a complete new master plan about access and circulation to and from the school. So we were able to then work with the high school, with the park workshop, to actually tie these two things together so that the high school wasn't planning in a vacuum and we weren't working with hydrologists looking at how to stop flooding in McIntyre Park in a vacuum. We want to bring things together and sort of break out of the silos. And we don't give you a lot of money we give you $10,000, we want to leverage that. So this is really about how do we leverage this fund to support other things that you have going on. Um, and that's really an exciting sort of aha moment. We also are part of the funding um, is to go to support additional follow-up meetings or forums or to bring back a resource team member to help with more information. Um, so it really is looking at what, are, what do you want to do now, 
What have you done? And what are the next steps going forward? You don't have to necessarily have that answer, but we want you to begin thinking about what some of those potential follow-up plans could be. What is your blue sky sort of dream? And we want to get to know you through your application and through that uh, conference call interview. So the community background section is your chance to tell us the story of your community. What does it care about? What is it challenged by? What opportunities do you see? And most importantly, how could this workshop tie all of this together? Applicants will be judged on having a clearly defined need for design assistance. That means that the host community has a great idea, but as I said earlier, it lacks the resources or expertise to undertake this work on their own. So this was um, on the left of your screen is the design challenge for the um, in Ile de Jean Charles, um, it is a tribe um, of the Chitimacha Choctaw Nation, and they needed to relocate their entire community to higher ground because their native tribal lands were um, being basically flooded by the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a huge emotional undertaking to basically relocate an entire village of people. And what they wanted to do was the first thing they wanted in their new home was to design um, a new community tribal center, sort of a community center where everyone could come together for meetings, for socializing, for powwows, discuss how to design, redesign their village. Um, very clearly you know, defined scope. And we also look to see that can this workshop with our two days and our technical assistance really provide a community with the help and information that they need? Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is it's an amazing idea, but this really may not be the right forum or the right venue to actually help address those issues. So this, the Tribal Center in Yelda Jean Charles was something it's very, it was very specific. Um, and they're continuing to do more work. So that's something else to think about. Um, is this award right for you? Is this a challenge that you think two days with amazing people is really going to get you off the dime and help you move to the next, next step? Project partners are key. Um, we ask them that they illustrate strong and specific commitments to actively participate in the workshop planning and production and follow-up activities. We'll ask you to explain why you have chosen the partners that you have, what their role will be, and what their commitment is to the project. So if, for example, uh, your design challenge relates to Main Street revitalization, uh, we're going to see, do you, have you included the Chamber of Commerce or the local Main Street organization or a business improvement uh, district as a partner? In Seguin, Texas, we work with the Hispanic uh, Chamber of Commerce. Um, on their trail project. So we really want to make sure that the topics that you're looking at, the workshop concept, and the partners are all aligned. So if you're doing something with multimodal transportation, do you have a bike trail group as a partner you know, on the team? Or maybe perhaps the local uh, Department of Transportation has written a letter of support. We just need to make sure that all of those things um, line up. We highly recommend demonstrating a partnership with a government um, entity. We ask you to demonstrate the degree to which your partners could involve the arts or design in engaging the community as appropriate in addressing the challenges. This is, in the NEA, it is a design um, award. And we know that arts and design are part of all of these topic areas. And we define arts and design really very broadly. Um, it's not like, yes, the kids are going to paint a mural, you know, on the side of the Chamber of Commerce. It doesn't have to be that specifically arts-oriented, but we do want ways of including artists and creativity um, in the workshop. Organization capacity and experience. Well, you know, we know that folks that work in rural communities wear a lot of hats. And we know that you don't have a lot of staff. And we know that many of your organizations are run by volunteers. And so it is really important to have a group of folks to help 
pull this together. Um, there is a broad skill set that is required, including folks that are great in outreach and communication, uh, folks that can do some fundraising to help you with your match, folks that are really good at asking bakeries to donate coffee and, and donuts, um, budget management, event planning, and follow-up activity planning. We also need people who can write. Um, we need folks that are really administratively, logistically sharp. And we ask you to sort of talk about the skills of your team um, looking at other events you may have planned together. Have you done other sort of community-wide meetings? Have you done, um, I don't know, a family fun day where you had 150 people? Um, have you done events that sort of reached out to a broader network? If you have, you know, monthly meetings and you've got eight people there, you know, we know that. That's that's great. That's the basic basic level. Um, but really, have you convened folks about an issue um, or coordinated um, sort of an action agenda against some sort of other issue that was coming up in your town? Um, you know, whether it was like a, a bridge replacement project or um, a new development, you know, do you have that kind of savvy and kind of pulling these kinds of things together. Do you do it on a regular basis or is this something that you really want to try your hand at? So that's something else that we're really looking at, this kind of previous efforts is to get a sense of what your capacity um, is to do this. And we also know that, you know, there's about a six-month window from when we award to when you have the workshop. Uh, people have babies. Um, people leave their jobs, people get elected to office. This has happened to all of us with our workshops. Um, sometimes people fall ill, unfortunately. And we just need there to be a resilience within your workshop planning team um, so that if somebody is out of the picture, there's somebody else to take the slack. And we also do not want this to fall and end up on the shoulders of one person with a part-time secretary. That's also happened. It just makes it really, it makes it difficult and it makes it more challenging than it has to be. So we really want this to be sort of a, a broad based. We want to know if you as the workshop leader and coordinator have a really strong, resilient team. Yes. Outreach, um, and this is within the community and beyond the community as well. Um, how are you going to secure meaningful participation from a diverse representative of representation of your community? How are you going to communicate with the general public about the workshop? Um, you're going to be asked to address the target audiences you hope to reach, as well as ideas you have about engaging them in the workshop and the follow-up activities. The Orton Family Foundation's Community Network Analysis Tool conveniently located in the coordinator's manual, is a helpful resource uh, for identifying various groups in your community that we're looking for you to engage. We are always looking at how do we engage young people and teens. And if we do the workshop, for example, on a weekday, two weekdays and it's school days, we know the kids are not going to be there. Can we have an event after school for them? Many of our workshops take place, for example, on a Friday and a Saturday. So that Saturday, there's an opportunity for young people and kids um, and working folks to participate. Uh, we do evening events as well, perhaps a dinner or a community celebration. We've done things in, at high schools. Um, it's really a lot of fun figuring out what that is to, to really make it possible for folks that can't give you two full days to be there, and especially for, for younger people. They are the next generation. We have, there's a lot of research that says that when kids and teens are involved in their community, planning events, putting on concerts, having bake sales, parades, whatever it is, if they feel invested that they are looked at as leaders in their community, leave to go to college, they'll come back. They will go out, they will make their fortune when they have families they will come back. And that's really what we want to instill in young people is that they have a place in this community forever. And you want them to come back and really feel rooted. And this is a really early way, 
especially when they're in high school, to get them feeling empowered and important. So they are their next generation of leaders. Um, and who are you going to bring to the table, and how might you bring the table to them? And that's part of this other kind of outreach. Um, if there's a tra- tailgate party for the local high school football team, like in Thomasville, Georgia, we brought the workshop results to the tailgate party. It was picnics, it was families, it was kids, it was clowns. We had a school bus. We put the drawings on the side of the school bus. We had kids give their ideas and rate the ideas and the designs, and their families were there as well. So we bring the table to the community. And as I said before, that's a really fun, creative way um, of making every workshop so completely different um, and, and unique. Okay, now we're talking about money and the budget. That was all the fun stuff. Um, your proposal must include a well-considered budget with adequate matching funds, which, as Dan said, can be cash or in kind to support the workshop planning. This is a budget template, um, and your budget should be submitted in this format. All of the cells add up. They multiply. You don't have to do math. Uh, if you put the numbers in, you know, things will tally and they will total. And there is an explanatory sheet on another tab that actually tells you how to fill this out. So this is where you tell us what you're going to be using the funds for and also how you plan to match it and what you think you'll be able to match. You don't need to have matching funds committed when you apply. But you should have a realistic intention for meeting the one-to-one match you can indicate, for example, your intention to get a facility donated. We're going to, someone's going to give us a facility. Usually it would cost $500, so the $500 goes into the in-kind match category. Um, you're going to try to get local businesses to donate goods, products, and services like printing, for example, or chair rental, et cetera. Um, you can put that in the in-kind. Staff time is also an eligible in-kind contribution um, to include in this match. And the items that we have listed here on the left are our thoughts about what the funding you know, can go for and what other communities have used their CERD award to pay for. If you have other things that you want to add to this, go ahead and do it. If there's... Um, you know, you want paint to paint a mural on the side of the Chamber of Commerce, for example, and you want paint, put paint. Paint is a very easy thing to get donated. Um, so this is not the end-all, be-all list, but this is pretty much the basic of what we are looking for you to, to do, and we expect um, that you would have funding um, to do that. Okay. All right. Letters of support. Um, You must include at least one letter of support from a partner organization and four additional optional letters. Letters are so of support can be endorsements from key entities or institutions um, stating that they're willing to participate in and support the workshop. Partner organizations do not need to submit letters of support because their commitment is presumed. Um, But you should, however, demonstrate involvement either through partnership or a letter of support from a local government entity. We did this workshop in Alton, Missouri. It was hunting season. The mayor and the entire town council was hunting, deer hunting the entire weekend. We really want these workshops to spark transformation, and we really need local leaders to to participate and to be aware and to kick them off, to give the final benediction, to participate. We've had all of that. So that's really what we're looking for, to really make this have a lasting impression. Supplemental materials are welcome. There's space in the application for them. But these should be, this should be uh, documents and items that you feel convey important information about your concept, community needs, background issues, capacity, et cetera. Uh, materials must be in digital form. They can include links to articles, videos, maps, community plans, websites, and more. And that is uh, entirely up to you. I'm going to now turn it back over to Jim. I'm going to just click here. 
and she will take us take us home. All right. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for all of that detailed information. Um, really, really helpful and wonderful to present to all of you listening in all about the CIRD opportunity. Um, we just wanted to leave you with the option to take a look at our website. We have lots of fantastic resources up there. Everything that Cynthia has covered in terms of the application questions that are specifically part of the online platform where you will submit your application to host a local workshop is up on our website. Also encourage you to review the request for applications that shares a little bit more nuanced information about the program. Um, and you can always reach out and contact us with questions. Uh, that is at CIRD at PPS.org and our wonderful colleague Angela will be there to respond to your questions. Um, as soon as possible. So please feel free to reach out. Um, also would encourage you to take a look at our frequently asked questions. So our FAQs on the website, just check there first to make sure that the questions, that burning question you have hasn't already been covered. And lastly, you just might be seeking inspiration from other rural communities to really get a sense for what are they up to. Um, um, what have they been doing? How have they been thinking about some of the same challenges? So I just want to leave you with uh, pointing you in the direction again at our website where we have a wonderful resource of catalogs webinars that we've done in previous years of the program on a wide range of topics, everything from creative placemaking to local food ecosystems. And our blog has some fantastic write-ups about um, our past CIRD workshop hosts and what they're doing now. So really, it's pretty, been pretty incredible to be part of this program and see how some of these initial visioning and workshop plans can really catalyze the community and, and lead to some pretty significant implementations, whether it's attracting additional funding and investment to do some real work um, on a main street in terms of uh, doing, you know, facade improvements or the redesign of streetscapes or to do some temporary programming to attract new energy to a place um, could help sort of lay the groundwork for the establishment of new trail systems. So there are lots of great ideas that have been done before and we really encourage you to check out the wealth of resources on our website and we hope to see you apply. We're, Really excited for this year of 2018 to, to see and hear from so many communities across the country. So with that, I am going to sign off and thank you so much for your time.